This is the fifth lecture in the series on the Battle of Okinawa, The Last Battle. In this lecture, I will describe the last mission of the IJN Yamato as part of Operation Tengo in the Japanese defense of Okinawa. The Kikasui-1 operation contained a decoy, the first diversion attack force intended to lure the American aircraft away from Okinawan waters. This diversion attack force consisted of the battleship Yamato, the light cruiser Yahagi, and eight destroyers whose mission was to draw away Spruance's aviators of Task Force 58 from the beachhead to allow the kamikazes to slip through. If by some chance the warships survived, they were to close the Hagashi beachhead to shoot up the U.S. transports and the Kadena and Yantan airfields. None, not even the Yamato, was to return. The ships carried only enough fuel to reach Okinawa. From the start, it was a suicide mission, the last gasp of the Imperial Japanese Navy. This mission was ordered on April 5th by Admiral Toyoda, commander-in-chief of the combined fleet. The entire undertaking was simply a ceremonial vehicle for the destruction of the IJN's last remaining symbol, rather than a serious plan with any hope of contributing to victory. The Yamato was the largest battleship in the world at 70,527 tons displacement, larger by far than America's Missouri at 58,460 tons, and the late German battleship Bismarck at 50,300 tons. At 862 feet in length, she was only 25 feet shorter than the Missouri and 39 feet longer than the Bismarck. Only in speed at 27 knots was the Yamato inferior to the Missouri at 32 and a half knots and the Bismarck at 30 knots. Yamato's keel was laid down on November 4, 1937, and she was commissioned on December 16, 1941, just nine days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It is ironic that this behemoth was soon to be eclipsed by the aircraft carrier whose planes eventually sank her. Viewed in hindsight, construction of the three Yamato-class battleships was a colossal waste of precious resources that could have been better allocated in the construction of carriers. The irony surrounding Yamato is compounded when its war record is reviewed. Throughout the first three years of the war, she never fired a shot in anger. Her undistinguished war service was spent mostly at moorings in southern waters, such as here at the Japanese naval base at Truk, punctuated by occasional supply runs to island garrisons. Yamato took two bomb hits on October 24, 1944, during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. They did little damage. In that battle, the Yamato task force transited the San Bernardino Strait under cover of darkness. Yamato and the other ships of the Japanese task force then took the ships of Taffy 3 under fire. During the brief battle, Yamato's main guns fired but never hit anything. Eventually, Admiral Kurita abandoned his mission, turned around, and sailed back west through the San Bernardino Strait. After the Battle of Leyte Gulf, there was little left of the Imperial Japanese surface fleet. Yamato returned to Japan as flagship of a fleet which existed mainly on paper. No one could quite decide what to do with her. Some officers felt the battleship should be moored at Curie as a floating anti-aircraft battery. When it was suggested she be used as a decoy in the Kikasui operations, several officers scowled disapprovingly. But what alternative was there? Playing hide-and-seek in the inland sea was dishonorable and a humiliation. Better to go out fighting. The Americans would be back. Better to face them in open seas than to lose face skulking in the inland sea. Vice Admiral Siichi Ito was the Yamato Task Force flag officer. Ito strongly opposed war with the United States. 
Like Admiral Yamamoto, he had spent two years studying in the United States in the late 20s, and although he admitted the Americans were somewhat baffling, he sensed their untapped power. He was also opposed to suicide missions. The one-way mission of Yamato, in his opinion, was a pointless sacrifice of ships, fuel, ammunition, and trained fighting men who were needed to defend the home islands. But the good officer that he was, he acquiesced to his orders. Before the war, the United States Navy lacked the ships to dominate two oceans. If war broke out with Japan, the United States Navy would have to transfer battleships to the Pacific through the Panama Canal. Here the Japanese believed they had found the formula for victory. The locks were limited in size. The biggest battleships that they could handle would display 63,000 tons according to Japanese intelligence estimates, with a maximum speed of 23 knots and an armament of 10 16-inch guns. The largest United States capital ship at the time, the Colorado-class battleship, for example, displaced less than 34,000 tons. Since Japan could not compete with the United States Navy with quantity, they would best them with quality. When it was still thought that the battleship was the main ship of the line in naval combat, Japan decided to build five of the biggest battleships in the world. Design work began in October 1934, and her keel was laid down on November 4, 1937. Strict secrecy was maintained from the outset. A hand-picked design team worked in total isolation. Such secrecy was later criticized for failing to throw the project open to a wider range of expert evaluation. Less directly involved experts might have detected several fatal design flaws. But secrecy was imperative because Japan was flouting her international obligations to restrict naval construction, the Washington and London treaties designed to prevent a worldwide arms race. So secret was the project that not even the American codebreakers knew about it. It was not until after the war, when the surviving records were surrendered, that the Americans realized exactly what they had been up against. Yamato was laid down in November of 1937 at Kure and her sister ship Musashi in March of 1938. The third ship of the class, Shinano, was laid down in May 1940. Shortly after the war started, it was realized that the battleship had been eclipsed by the aircraft carrier. Shinano's hull had been completed up to the weather deck when the Japanese lost the decisive carrier battle at Midway. Valuable time was wasted while planners haggled over conversion plans. The eventual compromise produced what was in effect an enormous carrier support ship. The 70,755-ton hybrid boasted an armored deck, enormous fuel and ammunition storage, but only 47 aircraft for her own defense. The ill-conceived project did not survive 24 hours at sea. While transiting from the building naval yard at Yokosuka for further outfitting in Kure on November 29, 1944, Shinano was spotted in the periscope crosshairs of USS Archerfish, SS-311. She fired six torpedoes in the dark at the large zigzagging target and dived to escape counterattack. A loud explosion reverberated throughout the archer fish, enough to claim an important but unidentified hit. Exactly what was hit remained a mystery until after the war. Only then was it discovered that the giant carrier's main cargo was 50 Oka Kamikaze flying bombs. Shinano's quick sinking decried its poor design. The original carrier design was a victim of incompetence. The remaining two ships of the Yamato class, hull numbers 111 and 797, never got off the design table.
The new battleships would be 70,527 tons displacement fully loaded. Because of her immense size and weight, she could only attain 27 knots speed. This was a major drawback. At this speed, she would consume a prodigious amount of fuel, something the Japanese did not have in abundance. She had a crew complement of between 2,500 and 2,800 officers and men. To put the size of this battleship into perspective, consider one 18.1-inch main gun turret of Yamato weighing in at 2,730 tons, more than the total weight of a U.S. Fletcher-class destroyer at 2,050 tons standard displacement. Although this is a British 18-inch gun, it gives you an idea of the size of the IJN 18.1-inch main gun barrel. The lower right photo is an IJN 18.1-inch armor-piercing shell. If the IJN Yamato's main gun battery fired at an elevation of 45 degrees for maximum distance, it could fire a 3,000-pound projectile 26 miles, essentially the distance of a marathon. In comparison, an Iowa-class main gun could fire a 16-inch, 2,700-pound armor-piercing shell 23 and a half miles. The longer range of the Yamato class main gun gave it a distinct advantage as it could hit a target outside the range of the target's main gun. Salvos from her main gun scorched, stripped the clothes off, and knocked unconscious exposed seamen stationed at anti aircraft guns. This meant that as more and more light anti aircraft guns were added during the war, they were packed amidships away from the blast of the main guns. This was a major error. A single hit in this overcrowded space could result in several of the guns taken out at once. These and other design flaws made her vulnerable to aerial attack, her ultimate demise. Yamato was the most heavily protected ship ever built, with armor weighing 22,534 tons, nearly a third of the ship's design displacement. The waterline armor belt was 16 inches thick. The deck armor was 8 to 9 inches thick and was calculated to be capable of withstanding a 2,500-pound armor-piercing bomb dropped from 10,000 feet. The three main turrets had nearly 26 inches of armor on the face, 10 inches on the side, 9.5 inches in the rear, and 11 inches on the top. After the war, the U.S. Navy obtained a portion of Yamato's turret face armor. They fired a 16-inch shell at it with this result. Admittedly, this was a test under non-combat conditions, but it illustrates the potential of the U.S. Navy's 16-inch shell. Yamato's primary gun was the 18.1-inch 45 caliber rifle, the largest naval artillery in the world. The triple batteries were located two forward and one aft. By 1945, the secondary gun battery consisted of two triple 6.1-inch gun turrets mounted fore and aft amidships. During the war, beam 6.1-inch turrets were removed and replaced with 12 5-inch guns placed in three twin mounts on each side amidships, these were for long-range anti-aircraft defense. When the aerial threat increased during the war, more 25mm anti-aircraft guns were added to bring the total to 162, mostly amidships. When the Yamato Task Force sailed on her last mission on April 6th, it assumed number one alert cruising disposition designed to protect against submarines with the destroyer at the head of the formation, other destroyers, and the light cruiser Yahagi flanked Yamato in the center at the rear. Yahagi was the third of four vessels completed in the Agano class of light cruisers, which were intended to replace increasingly obsolete light cruisers in the Imperial Japanese Navy. Yahagi displaced 7,590 tons. Its main battery consisted of 6-inch guns in three twin mounts, two forward, 
and one aft. To round out the task force, there were eight destroyers for additional anti-aircraft protection. Yamato and Yahagi were nested inside a ring of destroyers. I would now like to describe the ships of Task Force 58. These are the Essex-class carriers, known as Murderer's Row, that Yamato would go up against in Operation Tengo. They are berthed in the Ulithi Atoll Lagoon. This organizational table represents the American naval command structure in the Pacific. Admiral Chester Nimitz commanded the Pacific Fleet from Hawaii. Admiral Raymond Spruance commanded the 5th Fleet with his flag on Indianapolis. Admiral Mark Mitcher commanded Vast Carrier Task Force 58 with his flag on Bunker Hill. Admiral Sir Henry Bernard Rawlings commanded the British Pacific Fleet, Task Force 57, with his flag on King George V. Admiral Joseph Jocko Clark commanded Task Group 58.1 with carriers Hornet, Bennington, Bellawood, and San Jacinto. Admiral Ralph Davison commanded Task Group 58.2 with carriers Randolph, Enterprise, and Independence. Admiral Frederick Sherman commanded Task Group 58.3 with carriers Essex, Bunker Hill, Hancock, Cabot, and Baton. Admiral Arthur Radford commanded Task Group 58.4 with carriers Yorktown, Intrepid, and Langley. The central platform of the four task groups of Task Force 58 in April of 1945 was the Essex-class fleet carrier. Additional carrier support was provided by Casablanca-class escort carriers. The composition of task groups was constantly changing mainly because of kamikaze attacks. Typically, a task group was arranged in concentric circles of a layered defense. The most important ships of the task group, the carriers, were nested in the center of the circles with the battleships, cruisers, and destroyers farther out to provide mainly anti-aircraft protection, but also against submarines. This is a possible sailing configuration of Task Group 58.1. The task group consisted of one or more Essex-class carriers, up to two escort carriers, a battleship or two, a couple of heavy cruisers and a couple of light cruisers, and several destroyers. The Grumman TBF Avenger was introduced in 1942 and first saw action in the Battle of Midway. It was the principal torpedo bomber at this stage of the war. Here is an Avenger with the wings folded up on the hangar deck of an Essex-class carrier. This is the plane flown by then Lieutenant Junior Grade George Bush, future President of the United States. Here is a brief video illustrating torpedo drops, loading the torpedo into an Avenger, and the beginning of an attack in echelon form of Hellcats. The Curtis SB-2C Helldiver was a carrier-based bomber with the United States Navy. It supplemented and replaced the Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bomber. Here is a Helldiver with its wings folded and one on an attack dive. The Grumman F-6F Hellcat is an American carrier-based fighter. Designed to replace the earlier F-4F Wildcat, 
and to counter the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M0, it was the United States Navy's dominant fighter in the second half of the Pacific War. In gaining that role, it prevailed over its faster competitor, the Corsair, which had problems with visibility and carrier landings. This is a pair of Hellcats on combat air patrol, one of its primary missions, and several Hellcats spotted for takeoff. The Corsair was designed and operated as a carrier-based fighter bomber and entered service in large numbers with the U.S. Navy in late 1944 and early 1945. It quickly became one of the most capable carrier-based fighter bombers of World War II. Some Japanese pilots regarded it as the most formidable American fighter of World War II and its naval aviators achieved an 11 to 1 kill ratio. Note the characteristic gull wings. I would now like to describe the last sortie of the Yamato and the ignominious end of the IJN surface navy. The Yamamoto Task Force got underway a little later than planned during the afternoon of April 6 from Tokoyama Bay at 22 knots. The task force zigzagged, changing course by 20 degrees at five-minute intervals as it sailed into the inland sea. During the late hours that evening, the Yamato task force transited the Bungo Strait. As previously mentioned, during this leg of her mission, the Yamato task force was in number one alert cruising disposition, with Yamato bringing up the rear. Already the task force had been discovered. Radio intercept stations throughout the Pacific had been transmitting coded messages to the cryptanalyst center at Pearl Harbor for some days. There, experts had pieced together a complete picture of Japanese intentions down to the precise composition of Admiral Ito's force. Confirmation of this intelligence had come even before the task group reached open water. The submarines Treadfin and Hackleback, posted at the Bungo Strait for this very purpose, had reported Ito's passage at 1745 hours. This was the planned track of the Yamato Task Force to Okinawa. This is the track of Task Force 58 as she turned into the wind to launch her planes. This is the arc of the search radius of the scout planes of Task Force 58 looking for a Yamato that they knew was on the way. At 0330 hours, the Yamato and her nine escorts had reached the southern tip of Kyushu. She changed course to the west before turning south for Okinawa. By 0600 hours on April 7th, entering waters where the planes of Task Force 58 were expected, the Yamato Task Force assumed number 3 alert cruising disposition, a circular formation designed to repel an air attack which put the Yahagi in the lead and the destroyers spaced evenly around the Yamato, steaming majestically in the center. All ships continued to zigzag together using a preset time interval, still maintaining a steady 22 knots. The Yamato task force sailed without air cover. She would have to fend off the expected attacking planes of Task Force 58 by herself. The destroyer Asashimo began to fall behind. Using a hand lamp, Asashimo signaled that she was experiencing engine trouble. She fell further and further behind. At 0820 hours, two float planes from Task Force 58 spotted the Yamato Task Force. Yamato fired a salvo of beehives from her 18.1 inch guns at the float planes and missed. The float planes continued to track the Yamato but kept their distance. Sanshiki or anti-aircraft shell was a shell used by the IJN to combine flechettes with an incendiary anti-aircraft round. The type of layered construction of the warheads was generically referred to as beehive rounds. The shells were intended to put up a barrage of flame that any aircraft attempting to attack would have to navigate through. However, 
the U.S. pilots considered these shells to be more of a pyrotechnic display than a competent anti-aircraft weapon. The attack planes of Task Force 58 took off at 1000 hours into increasingly bad weather. The attack wave included mostly hell divers and Avengers. The fighters were already aloft in search patterns and combat air patrol. By 1100 hours, the weather had deteriorated further with intermittent showers from a 2,500 foot ceiling. This would benefit the Japanese. A total of 386 aircraft were sent aloft from 12 carriers of Task Force 58. Aircraft from five of the carriers failed to find the target in the bad weather or arrived too late to take part in the attack. The actual numbers of aircraft that participated in the attack was 227. At 12.32 hours, the Yamato's radar picked up the incoming planes. Ito ordered his force to sail into the worst of the weather. Task Group 58.1 launched 113 aircraft, 51 fighters, 21 dive bombers, and 40 torpedo bombers. This was followed by Task Group 58.3 with 167 aircraft, 80 fighters, 29 dive bombers, and 58 torpedo bombers. The last to launch was Task Group 58.4 with 104 aircraft, 48 fighters, 25 dive bombers, and 33 torpedo bombers, many of which were late reaching the target. Task Group 58.2 did not participate in the attack on Yamato, having been detached for other duties. The inclement weather made locating the Yamato task force difficult most of the attackers were guided by onboard radar. The attack proceeded in sequence with planes from Task Group 58.1 coming in first. At 12.37 hours, the first group to attack came from Bennington, CV-20. Four of her hell divers placed two bombs on Yamato around the main mast and destroyed a 5-inch gun mount. Several 25mm guns were also destroyed. Next came 14 Hell Divers from Hornet. Within two minutes, another two bombs hit slightly to port, just forward of the aft 6.1 inch gun turret. A group of eight Avengers from Hornet approached Yamato's port side. From their prior experience against Yamato's sister ship Musashi, they concentrated all torpedo hits on a single side to hasten the ship's demise. Seven Avengers launched a spread of seven torpedoes with four running hot, straight, and normal. Two were confirmed hits with a probable third hit. All three hit the port side. While Yamato was getting hammered, Hamakaze was hit by a torpedo, and Asashimo was finished off in minutes with a combined bomb and torpedo attack. Yahagi was also hit amidships by a single torpedo and crippled. During the attack in the first wave from Task Force 58, Yahagi took her first torpedo hit. Within minutes, she was dead in the water. Yahagi was hit by at least six more torpedoes and a dozen bombs by subsequent waves of planes. Isokazi attempted to come to Yahagi's aid, but was also attacked and heavily damaged. Yahagi capsized onto her starboard side and sank at 14.05 hours, taking down 455 of her crew with her. This is a summary of the hits on the Yamato during the first wave from planes of Task Group 58.1. There were two confirmed torpedo hits on the port side amidships and one probable on the port side aft. There were four bomb hits amidships. These hits caused a 5 to 6 degree port list. Ensign James Monahan was an Avenger pilot of VT-17 aboard Hornet. Ensign Monahan was credited with putting one of the torpedoes into the port side of Yamato. For his efforts, he received the Navy Cross. At 12.59, the planes of the second attack wave from the ships of Task Group 58.3, Essex, Bunker Hill, Bataan, and Cabot pounced on the ships of the Yamato Task Force. The strike group, VB-6 and VT-6 from Hancock, launched late and then got lost and were unable to contribute to the battle. 
Hell divers from Essex went in first, diving from 6,200 feet. Despite American claims to the contrary, apparently no direct bomb hits were made. Torpedo bombers from Essex, Bunker Hill, and Cabot claimed a total of 29 torpedo hits. In fact, only three were confirmed. Another probable hit occurred on the port side. There was a confirmed hit on the starboard side, the only hit on this side. This hit was from a Baton Avenger. This is a summary of the hits on the Yamato during the second wave from planes of Task Group 58.3. There were three confirmed torpedo hits on the port side and one on the starboard side and one probable hit on the port side. These hits worsened the list to 15 to 16 degrees. Counter flooding and the one hit to the starboard side reduced this list by 5 degrees. Speed was reduced to 18 knots due to the flooding and the loss of one propeller shaft. At this point, Yamato's damage was massive, but not mortal. That would change with the third wave attacks. At 1342, the final attack began from planes of Task Group 58.4, Intrepid, Yorktown, and Langley. Three bombs hit the port side amidships, exploded, but did little serious damage. The torpedoes caused more damage. Two hits were confirmed on the port side. This resulted in the loss of another propeller shaft. Another hit was confirmed on the starboard side. With no reserve capacity to conduct counter flooding, the crew was helpless to prevent the listing increasing to 17 to 18 degrees. The progressive flooding could not be checked. The list increased further to 22 to 23 degrees. The speed was further reduced to 8 knots on a single shaft. The ship could only steer in a large circle. This is a summary of the hits on the Yamato during the third wave from planes of Task Group 58.4. There were three bomb hits on the port side amidships and three torpedo hits, two on the port side and one on the starboard side. There was a third possible torpedo hit on the port side. The total hits on Yamato included 7 bomb hits and as many as 12 torpedo hits. Despite her protective armor, the damage wrought by the concentration of port side torpedo hits was too much. The Yamato was doomed to an ignominious end falling far short of Okinawa. Here is Yamato with an increasing port list. Shortly after 1400 hours, all power was lost. Yamato lay dead in the water. The list could no longer be contained and was increasing. The order to abandon ship was given, but it was too late. Soon after this order was given, the ship began to capsize to port. By 1420, she was on her beam. When the roll reached 120 degrees, a huge explosion tore the ship apart. At 1423 hours, the world's largest battleship sank beneath the waves. Only 276 men were saved. 3,055 Japanese sailors perished. The watery grave was marked by a column of smoke that reached a height of nearly 20,000 feet. The smoke plume could be seen in Kyushu, 120 miles away. Here is a map that shows the final tract of the Yamato Task Force. Having fallen behind and slowing, Asashimo was easily dispatched and sank at 12.30 with all hands. Hamakaze was attacked and sank at 12.43. Yahagi sank at 14.05. Yamato sank at 14.23. Kasumi came under attack, which caused her to lose steering control. She suffered 17 dead and 47 injured. The destroyer Fuitsuki removed survivors before scuttling her with two torpedoes that afternoon at 1657. Isokazi was similarly attacked and scuttled by destroyer Yukikazi with gunfire. She suffered 20 KIA. The sinking of the Yamato told the death knell of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Her surface fleet was virtually gone, certainly all her capital ships. All she had left as an offensive naval weapon was the submarine 
which would make only one more successful attack before the end of the war. That attack took place on the night of July 30, 1945, when the I-58 sank the USS Indianapolis. In the end, the last mission of the Yamato was a useless gesture that did not achieve its desired goal. It did not contribute in any way to the defense of Okinawa. Vice Admiral Seiichi Ito dutifully went down with his ship like a good samurai. His prediction had proved true. Here is a model of the Yamato debris field. Navy Minister Matsumasa Yanai was left the distasteful task of informing the Emperor of the disaster. Yanai bowed, wondering how to begin. Imperial Highness, I regret to inform you that the Yamato sortie has failed. Hirohito listened, aghast. Yanai continued, Yamato and most of the special attack force was sunk today by American carrier planes some 90 miles south of Kyushu. Hirohito was still trying to grasp the meaning of his minister's news. The fleet. What is the status of the fleet? There is no fleet, Imperial Highness. The Imperial Navy no longer exists. The fleet, he muttered disbelievingly, gone? It's gone? Hirohito swayed slightly, a hand to his temple. Yanai stood bowed in silence until the august presence disappeared behind a screen. I will resume this lecture series on Okinawa, the last battle, in part six, with the resumption of the land battle against the Shuri line.